but it worked. Good morning. It is good to see you. And isn't this fun? Yay. There's as many up here, almost, as there are out here. Grateful for the choir and their presence and leading us. Yes, thank you, Les. In our second reading from Luke's Gospel, we hear, it starts off, we hear the who's who of the political, social, and religious world of John the Baptist. This is when John hears the word of God for himself and begins to answer God's call on his life. So let's listen. This is Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So two readings in Luke. Think back to the first one for just a minute. Just imagine if soon after a child is born, say at their baptism, parents receive word from God about just what the child will grow up to be. Parents, imagine this. Even, even, if, you have, even if your children are grown and adult, imagine if this was your experience with your children receiving a word from God about just what the child will grow up to be. Now imagine, how, how would we parent differently if we knew that about our children? Or how about if instead of asking children, what do you want to be when you grow up? What if we asked the question differently? What if, what if we asked, what do you think God wants you to be? When you grow up, hmm, how would that change things? How would that change how children answer that question? Well, this was the experience of Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
Their beloved son, John, would be the one to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. His sanctuary was the wilderness. His pulpit, the banks of the Jordan River. He would call people to repent and be baptized, and he would proclaim a message of forgiveness. It was the job of this one child to get everyone moving into the family of God and to get people ready for the covenant to be renewed. John had a long to-do list uh, before he ever had his first meal. Zechariah and Elizabeth had to raise John in an environment where he would not, um, hopefully not make the choice to walk away from this calling. Now think about yourself. Imagine knowing from the time that you were a child what it was exactly that you were to do with your life. What do you think? Would that have been a relief to you? Um, would that make your life choices easier? Or would those expectations upon you have made life harder? Now, what if I tell you um, that I think that really is how it works? <laughs> You're right. Um, sort of. So I believe that from the moment of our baptism, maybe even before that, but definitely at the moment of our baptism, we are called. Our vocation is set. And that we are to spend the rest of our lives completing or fulfilling, living out that call. Let's go back to John the Baptist. It says, he went into all the region, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. At baptism, we are received into the family of God, and we receive our calling, our vocation. Now, I don't think it's as specific as being told that you will be a law enforcement officer or a missionary or a chemist, but it is specific. Our calling is to be who we are created to be. Our calling is to be. Now, maybe that sounds like that's an easy way to get out of this, of like unpacking this even more, but hold on. <laughs> Barbara Brown Taylor writes, uh, what many Christians are mis missing in their lives is a sense of vocation. The word itself means a call or a summons. So that having a, a vocation means more than having a job. It means answering a specific call. It means doing what one is meant to do. In religious language, it means participating in the work of God, something that few people think they do. Somewhere along the way, we have misplaced the ancient vision of the church as a priestly people set apart for ministry and baptism, confirmed and strengthened in worship, made manifest in service to the world. That vision is a foreign one to many church members who have learned from colloquial usage that minister means the ordained person in the congregation, while layperson means someone who does not engage in full-time ministry. That was Barbara Brown Taylor. So let me ask you, if I tell you that every baptized Christian is called to ministry, what does that sound like to you? Does it sound like more work? Yes, it sounds like more work. And most of you have all the work you can handle in the moment, um, all the work that you can do. It sounds like responsibility. And most people are staggering under loads that are already too heavy. Barbara Brown Taylor tells about a woman who listened to her, to her talk about this, her idea of the ministry of the laity. And um, Barbara Brown Taylor says that the laity are God's best hope for the world. The woman said, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be that important. Like that woman, many of us hear the invitation to ministry as an invitation to do more, 
to lead the Every Member Stewardship Campaign or cook supper for the homeless or teach vacation Bible school, or you hear the invitation to ministry as an invitation to be more, to be more generous, to be more loving, more religious. So let me remind all of us that ministry can involve involve just being who you already are. And ministry can be doing just what you already do. With one difference. That you understand yourself to, um, to be God's person in and for the world. In all that you be and do, that you understand yourself to be God's person in and for the world. Parker Palmer writes about vocation, and he says, vocation does not come from willfulness, it comes from listening. I must listen to my life and try to understand what it is truly about, quite apart from what I would like it to be about, or my life will never represent anything real in the world, no matter how earnest my intentions. The word vocation itself is rooted in the Latin for voice. It means a calling that I hear. I must listen for the truths at the heart of my own identity, not the standards by which I must live, but the standards by which I cannot help but live if I am living my own life. Now, I want to see if I can offer some ways um, to listen to your life. How do, how do we listen for our life? Several years ago, Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life, and it was widely popular in the church. And while the theology is more Reformed than it is Wesleyan, one particular section that I thought would be helpful um, as we think about listening to our lives um, and I want to share that with you briefly. So, so Warren says that each of us has a custom combination of capabilities um, that, that are uniquely ours and that makes us particularly suited for the life we are to live. And he's come up with an acronym uh, for how we come to know what we are to do, how we are to be um, in life. I'll shorten that. Um, so the acronym is SHAPE, and we have a giant bulletin this day that has lots of room that if you wanted to make notes on what that the SHAPE is. So the acronym SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E, like cookie cutter, SHAPE, um, it stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. So I'm going to say just a little bit about each of those spiritual gifts. These are God-empowered abilities. We don't choose them. We don't deserve them in any way. They are gifts from God given to us for the benefit of others. So shape, S, spiritual gifts. Um, gifts from God uh, for the benefit of others. H is heart. The heart is the source of our motivations. Another word for heart is passion. So things that we feel passionate about, things that get our heart rate up, okay, those, that's your heart, your passion, it all fits together um, in listening to your life. Abilities. These are the natural talents that you're born with, and it's also the skills that you've learned. So Rick Warren sees them as God-given and that they can be used for God's glory, and some of those abilities are, that, that are listed in Scripture are artistic ability, architectural ability, administration, baking, boat making, debating, designing, embroidering, farming, fishing, leading, managing, making music, painting, sailing, selling, teaching, writing. Those are all found in Scripture. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of others. S 
Spiritual gifts, H, heart, A, abilities, P is personality. And that refers to things like being introverted and extroverted, whether we are thinkers or feelers, if it, it is your temperament. And there is no right or wrong temperament. Your personality will affect how and where you use your spiritual gifts and your abilities. So, last one, E, experiences. Warren lists six kinds of experiences. Family experiences, uh, educational experiences, excuse me, vocational experiences, spiritual experiences, ministry experiences, and painful experiences. God uses all of it. God uses everything. Um, he writes, God never wastes a hurt. Um, your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. Um, but all of those experiences, family, educational, vocational, spiritual experiences. So, in all of these things, we are shaped for ministry, shaped for our calling and our vocation. So, what does that mean for us today, right now, here? What does this have to do with what we talked about last Sunday, about our Advent adventure? Um, and what does it have to do with preparing the way for what's next here I think it matters as we take our next step in this people over property and fresh expressions, adventure, and journey. Our next step is, is a very specific one. It takes some brainstorming together. So you'll get more information, but save this date, December 16th. That's a Thursday, I think. I think I have the right date this time. Thursday, December 16th. We're going to have two opportunities when we're going to come together and we're going to brainstorm about the Advent adventure that we are on and um, what's next for here at the Heights. So we'll look at ministries that we have previously had and how can we um, think about them, maybe tweak them in a way that involves including others. And then what's a new thing, a new fresh expression? So that'll be our topic for brainstorming on the 16th. And if you feel shaped for such a thing as that, to come together and brainstorm, uh, listen for more information. So in the second year of the presidency of Joe Biden, while Ron DeSantis was governor of Florida and Bill Mutz mayor of Lakeland, during the time when the Reverend Ken Carter was Bishop of the Florida Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, the Word of God came to the people of College Heights United Methodist Church. The people listened again to the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare your hearts and lives for sharing God's love in new places and in new ways. Prepare. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. So the word of God came into the wilderness that is Lakeland and beyond, and the people of College Heights United Methodist Church listened and heard the word. So I send you out to share that great good news. Would you go with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, and go in peace. Amen. Thank you.